Good evening, everybody. Really glad to see you here this evening. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, I know I've actually seen a couple of people here tonight who I feel like I haven't seen in a year or two, and it's really nice to see you here for our, our last event of the spring and of this academic year. I want to encourage you to keep, keep up with us because even though this is our last public event of this academic year, there's still plenty going on at the Center for Presidential History. I should introduce myself for those who don't know me. I'm Brian Franklin, and I'm the associate director of our center. Um, keep an eye out. We've got a travel course that's coming up that uh, some of you may be joining us for in the Czech Republic and in Germany. We are in the middle of our third season of our podcast uh, that, called The Past, The Promise, The Presidency. This third season is focused on the topic called The Bully Pulpit, the way that the president uh, uses his voice and his authority in all sorts of different ways throughout American history. And we are busy planning uh, a whole slew of events for next academic year. So just keep your eyes out for that. If you haven't already, you can go to our website and sign up for our mailing list, our email list, so that you'll always be updated about those sorts of things. And you can follow us on social media, on Facebook, or on Twitter. And uh, we also want to encourage you and invite you, uh, if you are really enjoying uh, what we're doing here at the CPH and would like to support us, uh, we have a group called the Article II Society, which is a way for you to get involved in supporting the CPH and kind of take advantage of some benefits that come with that, some special meals and events with our guest speakers, some uh, particular events that with some of our CPH fellows, everything from coffee house discussions to uh, history tours at the DMA, uh, but we would invite you to join us for those things as well. Now, I want to get to our guest for tonight, the reason you are here, not for me. It is A.J. Bame. A.J. is a best-selling author, a historian, and a journalist. He's the author of six or seven or so books, and I, you might be thinking you should know that before you get up, but I decided to say that because he himself said something like that earlier today. So I feel like if he's not exactly clear on how many books he's written, then I'm allowed to also not be clear. Uh, some of those books include uh, Go Like Hell, Ford Ferrari and Their Battle for Speed and Glory at Le Mans. You might have seen the film based on this movie just a couple of years ago. Um, I'm told that they offered the role to AJ, but he was like, look, Christian Bale needs some help. Give him the role. Um, his newest book is called White Lies, The Double Life of Walter F. White and America's Darkest Secret. It's an incredible story about a little-known civil rights leader in the first half of the 20th century. We got to hear a little bit more about it earlier today. Would encourage you to check that out as well. But uh, tonight, we're here to focus on a previous book that he wrote called Dewey Defeats Truman, the 1948 election and the battle for America's soul. So I'm going to invite AJ up in just a minute uh, to be able to speak to us and share with us about his research. And then as we usually do afterwards, we'll have a couple of microphones available and invite you to ask your questions and he'll kind of run his own Q&A. And then afterwards, we encourage you. There's a bookseller right outside and we'll have him in here. If you'd like to talk with him afterwards, get your book signed. Um, so thank you again for being with us and please welcome with me AJ Bain. Is this microphone phone working? Can everybody hear me? Does this thing work? That's good. It's a good start. So thank you for having me. Um, some of you may know, um, that's Harry Truman, uh, just in case there's anybody who doesn't know. Um, I'm here to talk to you about this book about the 1948 election. And the first thing I want to say was it was a real challenge to write a book about an election in which I knew that everybody who uh, was going to read it knows how the book ends. So how do I keep the pages turning? And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but I had an idea for a prologue that I wanted to talk to you about today. It starts with this question. Uh, history is yesterday's news. That's literally a fact. You can prove it. Um, does it matter? Is there anybody in the room who would say no? I thought not. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about why it matters, because I think it's really important, especially considering some of the things that are going on now. Uh, for, so for one thing, the way I approach writing, when I go into my office every day, I sort of get in a time machine. And I go back in time, I'm like Stewie and Family Guy. Nobody gets that reference in here. That's OK. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I go back in time and I try to really enter in a different time because my job uh, in writing this stuff is not to just tell you what happened uh, 
why it happened, when it happened, because you're going to find that in any other book. My job is to use, um, you know, to me, the most important tool that I can have as a writer is empathy. Uh, I really want to understand not just what is happening to these people, but what they're feeling. And when I'm writing, I want you to understand not just what's happening to them, but what they were feeling. I want you to experience their joy. I want you to experience their tears. So in other words, anytime anybody's reading fiction, you're reading it because you're engaged and you want to feel something. You're engaged in the story and you're absorbing. The same thing is true of nonfiction, or can often and should be. Um, uh, okay, here's another thought. Probably a lot of you have seen this quote before. Now, to me, um, in my lifetime, I've never seen a time in my life where I felt like this quote, this is an old quote, I remember hearing about this in college back in the horse and buggy days, but um, I never lived through a time where I thought that this was more important. I can't believe the most shocking statistic I've seen uh, in recent times is the number of people in this country who actually believe that the Holocaust didn't happen. Uh, the, no the number of people who think the Sandy Hook shootings didn't happen. It's because of this. It's a sinister thing going on. And I think it's really imperative uh, for the work of, that professors are doing and students are doing um, to create fact-based history, uh, ink on a page, uh, documentary. It's just really important. Um, and lastly, to come back to this guy. Now, Truman became president April 12, 1945. And in my book, The Accidental President, I spent 38 pages. The first 30 to 38 pages are just about this day because the shock to the country that you know this guy caused by coming into the Oval Office, nobody knew who he was. And one of the things they talked about uh, with Truman, uh, alarmed that he was walking into the Oval Office of FDR, who had been you know, the first four-term president, led us through the Great Depression, led through World War II, and many people in the military at that time could not even remember a time in their lives when FDR wasn't president. And one of the things people were shocked, obviously, uh, if you know anything about his presidency, they were shocked by his obscurity. But another thing they were shocked by was the fact that they thought he was largely uneducated because he had no college degree, whereas, of course, FDR was the product of the best schools. It wasn't true. He didn't go to college, or he dabbled in it, but he had no degree. Um, there's this story about Truman that kind of blows my mind because when you hear it, you can really sort of picture it. You picture this kid. Um, he had diphtheria. So he's something like seven years old, eight years old. And for an entire year of his childhood, he was paralyzed. And he would lie on the ground and uh, prop up books. And that's where his love of history began. And uh, it, he held it all through his life. So by the time he graduated high school, rumor, what they say is that he read every book in the Independence Library twice. But the fact is, he was extraordinarily well educated. Um, and this reading of history was exactly what enabled him to be successful in the White House, if we can all agree that he was, in fact, su successful in the White House. Uh, but this is something that he said. He said about history, the, wor the history of the world has moved in cycles, and that very often we find ourselves in the midst of political circumstances which appear to be new but which might have existed in almost identical form at various times during the past 6,000 years. So let me just run through a couple of slides. When I was writing, one of the reasons I wrote this book about the 1948 election was because it shocked me how relevant that election felt at the time I was writing of it, but even more now. So uh, a new media, 1948, the first election night's broadcast. And it was very clear that TV was going to revolutionize politics, revolutionize campaigning, revolutionize the conventions, everything. So this is the very first election night broadcast in 1948. You can see you know, how to rud rudimentary. Look at the little map there with the little stickies on it. Um, but we have the same thing today. Nothing has changed elections, in my opinion, more than social media. Uh, campaigning, nothing. So you have a new form of media that's going to be a game changer. Shocking, maybe. Uh, never in my lifetime did I ever think that I would see this. So that's Charlottesville. Um, in, in the post-war years, there was this resurgence of uh, white supremacy uh, groups, and they were acting very much out in the open. We're seeing the same thing now. Never thought that this would happen again. 
Um, does anybody know who this guy is in the middle? Yes, Isaac Woodard. Anybody know who the guy is on the left? It's former uh, heavyweight champion Joe Lewis of Detroit. So what you're seeing here is uh, a man named Isaac Woodard who uh, got out of the Army in 1946. Um, he was wearing his Army uniform. He had a couple bucks in his left pocket. In his right pocket, he had his discharge papers with the mimeograph signature of Harry S. Truman. Uh, still wearing his uniform, he got an argument with a white man uh, and was beaten by a police officer, and this happened. And the point I want to make was Isaac Woodard's story became a cause celeb. There was a massive uh, movement behind this man. He had a speaking tour. Here he's being led to a stage. Uh, there were concerts. Um, Orson Welles devoted all these radio programs. This is Black Lives Matter. This is where it begins. So it was then, and so it is now. Uh, feel free to light up. <laughs> you know what's not good for a presidency is inflation. Um, the biggest issue facing Truman, the president, in 1948 in terms of like the everyday voter and what the everyday voter's life was like was the price of consumer goods. Ring a bell? OK, that's Alger Hiss. And this is uh, the beginning of the Red Scare. But the point I want to make here is what's happening in this picture is Congress, the, the HUAC, H-U-A-C committee, uh, the House on Amer American Activities Committee, is interviewing this guy uh, because they believe there's a communist conspiracy within the United States government. And this is the beginning of the Red Scare. But what, what really strikes me is that for the first time in modern history that I know of, suddenly, and I might be wrong about this, uh, Professor Angle can raise his hand and correct me, but for the first time, there was a moment where uh, Americans really feared that something very was sinister was going on with the government. This was a deep state conspiracy. That's exactly what it was. Um, and we still, you know, there's never been a time ever where conspiracy issues, uh, theories have been, you know, mattered less in politics than now. And to me, this was the beginning, beginning of that. And sometimes I wonder if people who are behind all these conspiracies, you know, modeled some of their ideas after this man's case. I don't even need to comment on this. But uh, so it was then and so it is now. Our adversary, um, in Truman's first years in office, was the beginning of the Cold War. And the Cold War started actually over disagreement of the, go the government of Poland. The Russians thought, the Soviets thought, well, we can control the government of Poland. And the Americans thought, well, you know, you signed the American Charter and you, you, know, you agreed that Poland would have free elections. Um, now we have Ukraine. Uh, the Berlin blockade. So during the 1948 election, obviously, we were nose to nose with the Russians with this going on in Berlin. And I find just striking resemblances between what's going on in Ukraine and what's going on in Berlin and what the potential is to become of that. This was really like, this is, there were many sort of prologues leading up to the Cold War, but this is when it was like, this thing is on. And we don't know what's going to happen in Ukraine. Every day the news is worse, and every day the divide is greater. And there could be a new Cold War. And finally this. So during the 1948 election, specifically uh, before the conventions, were these, uh, um, the, uh, the nuclear uh, bikini tests. And there were a lot of people who were really, really scared of nuclear war as this was going on. Uh, and really frightened about what Russia could do, the Soviets could do when they got their bomb. So it feels relevant in a way in my lifetime that hasn't since the 1980s. Um, so that's why I think that when I wrote this book, I'm like, this is, it's not just the fact that the characters are so larger than life and elections are always mirrors of what is going on in a country. So to write about 1948 could be like to take a real snapshot of what our country was at that time. It really matters now for so many different reasons. Um, OK. So let's get to it. As you probably know, there were four candidates in 1948. And let me start by uh, setting a scene. So Harry Truman comes into office April 12, 1945. Um, the first four months of his presidency are the most history-packed four months of all time, the liberation of the death camps, death of Hitler, uh, the assassination of Mussolini, you know, uh, 
the fall of Japan, the atomic, first atomic test, the first atomic explosions, and the, the beginning of the nuclear arms race, and the beginning of the Cold War. All that happens in four months. And on the way home from Potsdam, Truman now has an 87% approval rating four months into his presidency, higher than FDR's had ever been. And he's coming home on the ship. I love to picture the scene in my head. The ship is moving. And he's got this guy named Judge Sam Rosenman with him. Uh, Sam Rosenman was FDR's chief speechwriter. And they're sitting together, and Truman says, get out a pad. And Rosenman got out a pad. I imagine he, Rosenman, he was a, a, an attorney and a judge, so I imagine you know, a, a yellow legal pad. But he starts taking notes. And Truman says, OK, this is what my policy, this is my political philosophy. This is what I'm going to stake my presidency on. And um, he, they, they write down the 21-point programs. Probably rings a bell. And uh, soon after that ship ride, Truman releases this to the American public. And people are shocked and appalled because they've had you know, many, many years of Roosevelt, many, many years of the New Deal. And they're ready for something new. And he re reveals himself to be a liberal. He wants to spend money on just about everything he can. Uh, right about this time, everything goes wrong. There's a housing crisis. Uh, there's a labor crisis. Um, basically, the point I want to make is I don't think that there could have ever been any leader ever who could have been president at that time who could have really been successful and had a decent approval rating in the public eye. It was just impossible. Um, so when it becomes time for the 48 election and he decides he's going to run, uh, the situation starts to get even more complicated. So as we know, uh, Jews are leaving Europe. They're desperate. They're poor. They're refugees. And they're all going to the homeland in Palestine. And Truman has to make this decision like whether or not to support the founding of an Israeli state. And the country is really divided about this. 4% um, of the electorate was Jewish in America at that time. But that was a really, really powerful 4%, influential, and also donors to the Democratic Party. Um, Truman sits with his State Department, George Marshall in particular. And George Marshall says, we cannot support a Jewish state. Cannot do it. George Marshall being the most highly respected you know, statesman in Truman's eyes. And he says, we're going to have a war with Russia. And if we offend the Arab states, we need that oil. We're going to have a war with Russia without oil. How are we going to do that? And the second thing he says is, if we support the Jews, we're going to have to do that with military power. We're going to have to install troops, because the Arabs are going to push the Jews into the sea. They're never going to survive. Well, he was wrong about that. Uh, but Truman has to make a decision about this. And the, interesting, the most interesting thing to me is that he's faced with two decisions. He has to make this decision from a political standpoint and a moral standpoint. What is the right thing to do? And um, he decides to support the, uh, the Israeli state, becomes the first public leader to um, uh, re recognize this, the nation of Israel when it's founded. I think it's, it's either May 12th or May 14th, 1948, right as the campaigns are beginning. OK, the next thing, huge issue, was civil rights. So Truman is faced with this issue. Uh, I want to paint a sort of a scene for you. Uh, this is my latest book. In 1946, a guy named Walter Francis White comes to the Oval Office and tells Truman these stories about returning black soldiers from overseas. They had served their country. They had earned the right to democracy at home. And there were a number of cases where uh, uh, black men who had served in the military came home, um, didn't like Jim Crow South, protested, and were killed, and in some cases tortured. And Truman is listening to this. And then Walter Francis White, who was head of the NAACP, gets to the story of this guy. And Truman is shocked. And he immediately writes the attorney general and says, we have to do something about this. We can't have this. This, is, this, this can't be going on in our country. And what happens is, for the first time ever, we have a president who comes out and makes a stand for civil rights in America in a big way. From a mainstream Oval Office perspective, this is the beginning of the civil rights movement. Now, Truman knows if he's going to do this, it's political suicide. Every, even Walter Francis White of the NAACP says, this is political suicide. If you do this, you will never be elected. Because the huge power base, of the Democrat, a huge power base of the Democratic Party 
was the southern states of Georgia and Alabama and Louisiana and Mississippi, where uh, you know high-ranking members in Congress were heading the committees, and um, they were white supremacists, unabashedly so, all of them. And black people were not allowed to vote in the southern states for generations. Um, so Truman knows if he supports civil rights, it's gonna, it has the potential to completely destroy the Democratic Party and destroy his, his presidency. At the same time, 1944, has anybody heard of Smith versus Allwright? Anybody? Well done. 1944, uh, the Supreme Court rules that essentially, to make this more simple, what the Supreme Court rules in Smith versus Allwright in 1944 is that it's unconstitutional to deny black people the vote. So all of these black people in the South, African Americans who are not allowed to vote, suddenly they're realizing that black power is gonna become something real. Um, and so Truman has this decision. He could destroy his own presidency, but he could court black voters by getting behind the civil rights program. Was it a moral issue or a political issue? Everybody, I've studied this a lot. Everybody in the Truman circle that I've read about said it was for him, it was a moral issue. And he was from Missouri. Both of his parents had been slave owners. Both of his parents supported the South in the Civil War. So Truman shocks the country by coming out. He desegregates the military. He campaigns in the spiritual home of black America in Harlem. And he gives this speech. And to me, this is this wonderful this historical speech. And I'm going to play a little bit about uh, right now. He's uh, on the, uh, at the foot of the, of the Lincoln Memorial. And notice how slowly he talks. Let's see, how do I do this? One, two, three. I should like to talk to you briefly about civil rights and human freedom. It is my deep conviction that we have reached a turning point in the long history of our country's efforts to guarantee freedom and equality to all our citizens. So historical speech. Uh, now, the last point I want to make before I move on to our next candidate, because we have four of them, uh, by the time the, the campaigns begin, everybody counts Truman out. Uh, Drew Pearson, who was the most popular political columnist at the time, he said, Every seasoned political leader in the Democratic Party is convinced Harry Truman will suffer one of the worst election defeats in history. Everybody believed it. And uh, Truman goes to the um, Democratic National Convention and gives this wild speech. And I'm going to play you one little piece for it. If you're a Democrat, you'll laugh. If you're a Republican, you'll cringe. But remember, this happened a long, long time ago. And this is history speaking. Uh, how do we get this to work? All right, I took it out. I must have taken it out. But what he says is he gives this speech and he says, we're going to win this election and make the Republicans like it. I can tell you that. And the crowd goes, wow. Ah. And so his campaign begins. And he gets on this campaign train. And everybody literally thinks it's a laughing stock. OK. Love this picture. Now, one of the ways that I wanted this book uh, to function because everybody knows how it ends, was to go uh, in the places where a lot of the books beforehand in the 1948 election never went. And by that, I mean I really wanted to look at all four candidates, because they're fascinating, every single one of them. Um, and this man is fascinating. Today, Dewey is known almost exclusively for the, for the headline, Dewey Defeats Truman, and for being the guy who lost the greatest upset in electioneering history. But in fact, he was an extraordinary leader, an extraordinary man, a man with a moral compass who I think would have been an amazing two-term president. I really, really do. Um, when he begins his campaign, everybody believes that he's the man. He'll be the, next, he'll be the first Republican president in, uh, since 1932 elected. Uh, he gets General Eisenhower to, um, to uh, endorse him, which was an extraordinary thing. Now. The point I want to make about him is, in 1948 was the first election after the war, right? So all the political parties, there were many of them, had to recreate themselves. And they'd say, with all of this history that just happened, this is who we are. This is what we're going to do in the modern age, the first post-war election, the first election in the atomic age, the first election 
in the TV age, uh, it was a line in the sand, and these parties had to recreate themselves, and they had to decide who they were going to be. Now, the Republicans had a really grave identity crisis. Um, the Congress was controlled by the Republican faction. They were very conservative, led by Robert Taft, Mr. Republican Robert Taft of Ohio, um, who supported what we think of today as traditional conservatism, namely small government, leave the spending to the states. Uh, we don't make a lot of rules. Um, but Dewey had come of age a uh, Teddy Roosevelt fan, which was a very different, different brand of republicanism. As a matter of fact, his father was such a fan of Teddy Roosevelt that he named his son Thomas E. Dewey because the E, T, E, D, the initials actually said Ted. Um, that's how he was raised. So one of my favorite parts of the story is how he wins the nomination because he's the front runner going in, but actually he almost loses. And all of the, you know, the nomination comes down to the primary of all places in the state of Oregon. And in Oregon is held the first ever broadcast presidential live debate. And it's Thomas Dewey against Harold Stassen, who was from Minnesota. And there's one question they each have to answer it, and that is, should communism be outlawed? And I tell you, you can go home and listen to that on YouTube, and you can listen to the whole debate, and it's fascinating. And what's so interesting about it, this guy had come up, his career, he had come up as a, a prosecutor, a brilliant, brilliant attorney. So in the 1930s, I should have mentioned this earlier, he became famous uh, as a crime fighter. And uh, he became famous for putting away all of the big time 1930s gangsters and so much that there were two movies in 1937 and 1938 based on his life in which Humphrey Bogart played Dewey and Lauren Bacall played the love interest. And it was said that Dewey was so brilliant as an attorney that he could actually prosecute God and win. <laughs> so when he goes to this debate, there's, Stassen has no chance. And it's interesting to listen to because you just hear, when you see somebody, hear somebody in a debate who just like destroys his competition just through his brilliance, that's that debate. So he wins the nomination. This is the Republican National Convention. And as they go into the, uh, the election, not a lot of people notice that there's this grave identity crisis of the Republican Party, that Dewey actually agreed with Truman on just about everything. But the Republican-controlled Congress did not. Um, let me just, so, OK, so Dewey and, uh, and um, Truman, they clashed on the, tar ta ta the, ta the, sorry, the Taft-Hartley labor law, which um, maybe I'm not going to go into it now because it's very complicated, and tax cuts. But they agreed on uh, government spending for Social Security and education. They both supported the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, both supported strong stand against the Soviet Union, bipartisan foreign policy. Uh, both supported programs to root out communist conspiracies without employing thought police. Uh, both wanted to raise the minimum wage, use federal funds to confront the housing crisis and clear urban slums. Both supported developing hydroelectric power. Both supported Israel. Both supported civil rights. So if you think about it, there was not that much difference between the two candidates going forward, except for the fact that one was universally expected to win and one was expected to lose. Uh, I love this picture. Um, the funniest thing that I read about Dewey's campaign, he traveled the country, as did Truman, on a train. And a train would move along from town to town, and he would go out and back and uh, give these speeches, and then every big town there'd be a rally. And I remember reading that the biggest criticism of Dewey was that his rallies were too perfect and that his speeches were too perfect. And I'm thinking, ah, all right. And there's one moment during the campaign where the two candidates meet in person. And this is it. This is another fascinating scene. Think about this. Uh, who's been to John F. Kennedy Airport? A lot of people. This is the dedication of John F. Kennedy Airport. It was called something different there. I believe it's called Idlewild. Um, and so during this time where we're nose to nose with the Soviets in Berlin, they turned this into the biggest demonstration of military air power in peacetime history. And, but it was 
they were just dedicating an airport, right? They wanted the Soviets to see what was going on. So above them, the entire American Air Force is flying around. Um, and these two shake hands. It's the only time they meet. And true, this has actually happened. Truman leans over and says, Tom, when you get in the White House, would you fix the plumbing, please? <laughs> Okay, to me, okay, so there's another candidate who to me, his story is just as fascinating as the others. This is Henry Walls on our right. Um, behind him is Glenn Taylor, who was the, uh, uh, the, his vice presidential candidate, and they launched something called the Progressive Party. Um, Glenn Taylor, he was known as the singing cowboy. He was a congressman, I believe, from Idaho. And he was known for wearing, he had been a country and western star. And he was known for riding up the steps of the United States Capitol in his country and western gear on his horse. And uh, he was also known for, um, he was a bald man that made his own homemade wigs. And after he left uh, public service, made a fortune in the wig business. That actually happened. Uh, this is Pete Seeger here, the, the folk singer. And uh, what I think of when I think of the Progressive Party is this is the birth of the modern like anti-establishment in America. The beatniks, the hippies, to me, it all flowed out of this candidacy. Um, Wallace had been a vice president under FDR who got kicked out of the White House essentially because he was very, very liberal uh, and he thought of himself as a mystic. And in uh, Truman's early years, in this amazingly bitter bipartisan time, Congress, both Republicans and Democrats, came together and launched the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine. Um, we, basically, we know what that is, but basically, in this unprecedented campaign to take millions and millions and millions of American taxpayer money and hand it over to foreign countries in hopes that they can build up, re, you know, re build their infrastructure so they wouldn't fall to the Soviets because really weak countries with ter terrible economic problems were prone to uh, communist aggression. So Wallace has this idea that we're um, offending the, the Soviets and we're doing these nuclear tests and he has it in his head and he could have been right that the Truman administration was leading the United States into war with the Soviets and that we were on the brink of World War III and it was Harry Truman's fault. And he goes out and campaigns on this idea that he's literally gonna save the human race. He's going to save the world. If people don't vote for him, everybody's gonna die. There's gonna be World War III and we're gonna have nuclear warfare. Um, but he was a little off his rocker and a lot of things happened along his campaign. Some letters he had written came out that were truly bizarre. Um, they were called the guru letters. Uh, he denied that he wrote them, but he did. And um, what, the point I want to make that was most fascinating to me about Henry Wallace's campaign is something that we can really see in our country today, specifically in the Donald Trump era, where he would campaign in New York and San Francisco and LA, and he could pack Yankee Stadium with paying fans, pay, that people pay to see him speak and sell out Yankee Stadium hugely popular, popular in big cities. And at one point, Henry Wallace and it goes, and he goes campaigning through the Deep South. And he knows that his politics are so to the left. Uh, and he talks about the fact that he's going to campaign in the Deep South, but only stay in the homes of black people. He won't stay in any hotel where, because it, where black people and white people can't stay in the same hotel. And he knew before he got there that people were going to be furious and that there was even likely to be violence at their rallies. And there was. There was a stabbing at his rallies. People were punched and kicked. Um, one person who traveled with the Wallace campaign uh, kept track and found that during his speeches, during that two-week period in the Deep South, while speaking, he was hit with a total of 27 eggs, 37 tomatoes, six peaches, two lemons, one orange, and one ice cream cone. <laughs> Now, Wallace um, won zero states. He didn't perform well, but I think a lot of his ideas, equal rights for women, uh, 
a lot of his ideas were way ahead of their time and really brilliant. And something happened to me years ago uh, when this book came out, or no, this, the b book before this, I was on an NPR program called 1A, which stands for One First Amendment. And I said something derogatory about Henry Wallace, and the phones rang off the hook. People started calling in, and they were mad. And it was so shocking to me, because I couldn't realize that even today, this guy remains a hero to the far left. People are still crazy for him. There he is. It's a very dramatic picture. And here's our fourth candidate. So this is Strom Thurmond. Uh, there's a lot to say about him, but the first thing I want to say is war hero. He had witnessed the, uh, the liberation of the camps, wrote about it, horrifying. Came back, is very young, very successful um, governor of South Carolina. And at the Democratic National Convention, because of the civil rights program, the southern states rebel. It's this dramatic scene where they literally get up and they walk out of Madison Square Garden and make this big to-do with Confederate flags and they're yelling, you know, the Truman Civil Rights Movement is gonna doom the Democratic Party forever and Truman can't win. So they launch their own candidate and they have their own convention. And we know them as the Dixiecrats, but it was really called the States Rights, States Rights Democratic Party. Uh, I wanna read to you exactly, literally what he's saying. This is the convention in Birmingham. And he says, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that there's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the, admit the Negro race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches. If the South should vote for Truman this year, we might as well petition the government for colonial status. I can think of nothing worse for the South than to tuck its tail and vote for Truman these uncalled for and these damnable proposals he has recommended under the guise of so-called civil rights, I'll tell you the American people had better wake up and oppose such a program because the next thing will be a totalitarian, totalitarian state in these United States. Now that's his message. And throughout his campaign, he never mentions taxes, doesn't talk about Berlin, doesn't talk about uh, civil rights, I mean, doesn't talk about Israel, doesn't talk about anything. He just talks about segregation and white supremacy. And that campaign wins him four states in the South. Um, and Truman is thinking, okay, Smith versus Allwright, 1944. You may win four states in 1948, but let's see what happens in 52 and 56 and in the future. Um, the most important thing about what I, about Strom Thurmond's campaign to me is, this was the beginning of the movement. Uh, you know, the Democrats had been the solid South of the Democratic Party going back to the Civil War. And this was the beginning of the movement of the migration of those states over the Republican Party, where it has remained for many years, but may be changing. Because it's really interesting to think, I never thought in, in modern times that I would see a black man and a Jewish man elected uh, to the United States Senate from the state of Georgia. Um, I call that progress. Maybe some others don't. I don't know. Um, Strom Thurmond. Uh, okay. So the campaigns are going on, and something extraordinary happens. Um, very few people notice it, except for Harry Truman. This is a Truman rally. Um, and it was really fun to write about this, because there's so much documentation and so many, there's oral histories from every single person on the Truman campaign tra train, oral histories talking about the experience of living on the train, uh, weeks and weeks at a time, and how the narrative of the election shifted from this guy who had no chance, and suddenly this strange thing was happening. The reporters on the train didn't notice, but Harry Truman did and the people around him did, where suddenly his speeches began to what they called go over. And the crowds began to just be like shockingly huge to come out and see President Truman speak. And the way he won this election, there were two things he did. One was policy. He, this is his words, he built his whole campaign around one single issue. There were all of these things going on, but he really focused entirely on one issue. This is how he, he um, defined it. The campaign was built on one issue the interests of the people 
as represented by the Democrats, against the special interests as represented by the Republicans and the record of the 80th Congress. I staked the, I staked the race for the presidency on this one issue. And what he was saying was, he went around the country and saying, said, if the Republicans are, con are allowed to continue controlling Congress and the presidency, they're going to hand the country over to Wall Street and special interests, and all you people are going to pay the price. The rich are going to get richer. All you people are going to pay the price. Was that populism? Was it true? You know, we all have to sort of decide for ourselves, but it worked. And uh, he barely ever said the name Thomas Dewey. He, he fought his election against the 80th Congress because Thomas Dewey agreed with him on almost every issue. But the Congress did not. And this strategy won. But something more uh, interesting happened as well to me is his strategy was really to go as many places as he could and go places where presidents never went and expose people to the magic of the American presidency but not to President Truman. He wanted to expose people to Harry, to who he was. And almost all of his speeches were impromptu. He had set up something called the Research Division in Washington and a speech writing team in the White House. And they would gather up all of this information, put it on a plane, fly it to wherever the Truman train was going to be. They'd pick up this information, because they didn't have you know, a lot of technology. And that way, when Truman rolled into some small town at 2 in the morning, he could go out in his pajamas, and he would know that this small town in South Dakota had a new sausage factory, or that somebody very unpopular in town had died in the war. And he could speak to these people very plainly as himself. And in the process, he really became not just a candidate, but an American folk hero. And the strategy worked. And uh, he won. This is Harry. That's his daughter, Margaret, and she's casting her first ballot because she had just become old enough. This is her first presidential ballot. And that's the first lady. You can guess who they voted for. Um, I hope this works. So uh, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the drama of the election night. And the saddest part is to see Thomas Dewey. He was supposed to come down at 9 o'clock to his campaign headquarters and give his acceptance speech. Ten, 9 o'clock came, he didn't come out. 10 o'clock came, he didn't come out. And what he did was he shut himself in his little room in the Roosevelt Hotel with a legal pad, and he just sat there by himself, and he was coming to grips with what was happening. He had to you know, understand that he was going to lose. Um, all the while, the Republican National Committee is sending out, and these these are extraordinary documents, sending out press releases at 9 o'clock, and they're all time stamped at 11 o'clock, even 2 o'clock in the morning, saying, it is now confirmed that Dewey will be the next president of the United States. Excuse me. <clears throat> this is what people saw on TV. I hope this works. Uh, no. How do I make this work? There should be a little thing down here. OK. Well, anyway, this is the broadcast. <laughs> um, I wish I could make that work. <clears throat> Here's how the story ends. Um, in this remarkable moment of irony, when the Republicans believed that they were going to win, they voted to um, up the budget for the inauguration day by $80,000. <laughs> and here you have it. That's the Vice President Barkley. Margaret Truman is really enjoying herself. Um, there's a couple of takeaways I just want to mention. Uh, one is that. Even during this extraordinarily vicious political cycle, um, in Congress, Democrats and Republicans came together to launch the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine, two of the most important foreign policy uh, programs in the history of the world, not just the United States. Truly radical, so radical that they didn't know if it was going to work. Turns out it did. Um, <clears throat> 
But you can imagine, like, if, if in 2024 the President of the United States came to Congress with a really radical foreign policy program and got everybody on board. Because I think as bitter as the political discourse was at that time, people in Congress and everybody in government understood that the health of our nation, the future of our children, the future of our country was more important than politics. And I really, really hope and like to think that if our country was facing a situation like that again, that the result would be the same. I really hope so. Um, and the last point I can make is that, you know, I just want to say that th these are like, to me, they're just like the, uh, really human stories that reflect what was happening in our country. There's no better way to sort of take a snapshot of a country at a time than to look at the political leaders, what their stances were, who were supporting them. And that, to me, is like the essence of this book and of the 1948 election, is how much we can learn and sort of take a snapshot of our, our country at that time. And I think a lot of people would agree that, you know, except for fear of war, it was a pretty amazing place to be. So this is Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrats with one delegate in Tennessee, but he won four states. And you can see it was blue all around. Thomas Dewey went to the grave thinking that it was farmers who flipped. Farmers who were supposed to vote Republican, states like over here, didn't vote Republican. And part of that was because they knew that Truman was a farmer, a very skilled farmer. He had come up a farmer. But also he won their vote. He went to those little towns and he convinced them. So this is what the map looked like. And uh, I don't know how we're doing our time. That's the end of my presentation. I'm hoping that some people have some questions. I hope I wasn't too long or too short. I really don't know. But thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. Yes. Because Truman didn't get much support from the Democrats. Or... That's true. So the question was, can you speak to the financing of, uh, of, the, of the Republicans? And, you know, and I think the answer is um, uh, a lot of the tra traditional Republican pl places, there was corporate money, but there was not a lot of emphasis placed on raising money because they didn't think they needed it. They didn't think they needed it, which was shocking because they themselves, late in the campaign, were suddenly shocked that they were stunned that they were lacking in funds. And there's a scene in the book where they all get together and they're like, we need to, like, it's late in the game, we need to raise money. And they really didn't see that coming. Um, uh, equally as fascinating was the lack of funds in the Truman campaign. So there was a couple of different instances where the, tr the Truman train would roll through. There's two I can think of, once in California and once in Oklahoma, where they literally ran out of money and the train stopped. and then. They had to literally get on the phone and beg for money all over the country to find where they can find it. Um, but by modern standards, none of the campaigns were particularly highly financed um, the way we would think of it today. And one of the reasons is because they weren't paying for television. So the, the TV cameras for the first time were at the conventions, but NBC and CBS and ABC was paying for that. Uh, and they were uh, on the road and, of course, the election nights. But um, really, the, the financial story of the election was the shocking lack of money that the Truman campaign had and how they kept the trains rolling. Um, this gentleman had a question. Uh, yes. Uh, hypothetical, but based on your study and intimate knowledge of Truman, how do you think the Truman of that time would handle the Putin of our time? That's a great question. Um, that's a really good question. I think that um, he would handle it exactly as Biden is handling it. I think that he would do everything he could economically 
as he did, you know, as they did with the Truman Do Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, um, and be smart enough to not get ourselves engaged in uh, a nuclear war. But as it was with the Soviets in those years, it's a, a, a horrendously unsolvable problem that I think, as it did then, will take years and years to play out. And the, the one interesting thought I'm having is like, well, the Truman administration at that time came up with these brilliant, brilliant programs. And what is the answer to those types of foreign policy programs today? That if they weren't going to work tomorrow, they would eventually work and work very well over long periods of time. Does that answer the question, I hope? <clears throat> Yes, I'm, I'm uh, surprised that Thurman, Thurman uh, only won four states. I mean, for what you said of all the delegates that walked out of the uh, uh, Democratic Convention, did Truman have a strategy to try to hold as many of the states in the Deep South as he could, and that really kind of put him over the top? That's a great question. I mean, there were states that didn't vote for Thurman, like for Texas, and I talk about specifically, I answered that question very specifically using polling numbers in certain states where uh, Strom Thurmond really thought he was going to do well and didn't. So he had something like 8% here, uh, not a lot of percent there. And I think a lot of that was just the fact that it was so ingrained in people's heads that, you know, you voted for the Democrats if you were from these states. Um, for, for generations and generations. In fact, there almost was almost no Republican Party in existence in much of this part of the country at that time. Um, and that just started to change gradually. Like, for example, North Carolina in 1948, you started to feel resurgence of the Republican Party there. Um, but I think it was just the fact that that's the way things were done. You didn't, and Truman campaigned in these states, particularly here. He, did, he campaigned a bunch in here. And, uh, I think it was very successful. It's funny that you asked that, though, because to me, from where I stood in my modern sensibility, I just find it so shocking that a, a politician uh, would campaign on a single issue and win those four states. But um, you know, you, I think that the more I did the research, and I understood the mentality. I was just curious. What was the derogatory thing you said about Henry Wallace that <laughs> caused all the ire to emerge? I probably called him a crackpot. Because that's what, you know, um, that's what a lot of people thought of him at the time. The guru letters are fascinating. I encourage everybody to Google guru letters and read them. Um, and there were other examples, like Henry Wallace was an expert at throwing a boomerang and catching it when nobody had ever heard of a boomerang. And he had all these crazy theories, like, for example, um, uh, you could. Uh, someday there would be uh, an invention in which you could get all the nutrients from all the food you needed in one pill. <laughs> There's a great story of how he liked to box. He was a brilliant tennis player before anybody had heard of tennis. And uh, he liked to box. And there was this famous story about how he knocked out one of the, <laughs> this picture of him fighting another congressman, and he knocked him out. But I think I probably called him a crackpot, and I probably used that word, and I probably should not have. Speaking of Wallace, he was vice president under Roosevelt, F right? FDR, yes. So why was he displaced and Truman took him, took over? Uh, I think specifically for the reason that I say, and I do go into that pretty deeply in my book, The Accidental President. Um, there was a movement among all the people surrounding FDR, because FDR really liked Wallace, and he told Wallace that Wallace could stick around as the vice president. And then all the people around FDR went on this campaign to get rid of Wallace, because they feared him. They feared that if Wallace became president, that his politics were too far to the left, and that um, they just found him to be very strange. And he made, he made people uncomfortable. So there's this famous meeting in the White House um, where all FDR's advisors gather around him, and they convince him to drop Wallace. And he, he's like, OK, who's going to be the vice president? And they go through each person. And there's a reason why each person um, doesn't quite fit the bill. And the obvious choice was Jimmy Burns from South Carolina. But Burns uh, 
would have offended black voters. So he was out. Uh, there were other candidates, and eventually somebody mentioned the name Truman, and, and FDR said, isn't that the guy who's uh, the head of my you know, national committee on the, on, the, on the defense industry? And he was so egotistical, sorry, that he didn't realize that it wasn't his committee that he created. It was tr the Truman Committee. It was actually called the Truman that Harry Truman had invented. Long story there. But uh, Truman was thought of as, as the guy who um, would offend the least number of voters. And so he just, quote, dropped into the slot. Uh, but they, they, the people around FDR were adamant that Wallace go bye-bye. Well, FDR was a supreme politician. He was going to do whatever he had to do to get himself reelected. And so uh, he actually told Jimmy Burns that Jimmy Burns was going to get the nomination. And uh, he strongly worded to Wallace that Wallace could stick around. And then he went around everybody's back and, and dropped them all. Um, I, in my book, The Accidental President, I go pretty, there's a couple of chapters, there's a, there's a lot in there about that, leading up to the Democratic National Convention, which I think was in Chicago because the convention is just so, because Truman is blind to all of this. He doesn't know any of this is going to happen. And he shows up in Chicago. He had already written the speech to give the nominating speech for Burns to be the vice president, uh, not knowing that FDR had already decided that it was Harry Truman who was going to be the next vice president. It's an amazing story. Um, uh, so you have shown that history repeats itself, like you talked about all the similarities from Truman and then, you know, with the juxtaposition of the photos from today. Um, so with your oracle, what history is going to repeat itself next, do you think? That's brilliant. That's a really unexpected question. <laughs> wow. <sighs> okay, here, here, well. Will Donald Trump be president again? I don't know. Um, I, that's a brilliant question, and I have to think about that because, you know, wow. That's the subject. OK. I would like to know if anybody else has a thought about that. That's, that's, a, that's a mind bender. Let me think about that. That's a wonderful question. You stumped me. That doesn't usually happen. Professor Engel. I, I wanted to ask a different question, but now it occurs to me I, what I really should ask is, why don't you answer her question? <laughs> Give uh, me a little time. Do we guys get a couple hours I can just pace? I usually <laughs> think while I pace, and so, you can all just sit here for 10, 15 minutes? Let me, let me ask you one that's more, more uh, fully in the past. Could you compare the coalition or the results, I guess, that Truman manages to get in 48 with the rest of the New Deal coalitions? How much of we were? I mean, we're, as, we're all surprised in some way. This is the beauty of your book. We're all surprised by the ending that we know the ending, and I'm wondering how much, in retrospect, we should have looked at the electoral map and said, you know, it actually is just kind of piecing things together again, as Roosevelt did. What's the difference between the Roosevelt coalition and Truman's? Interesting. I would say definitely. One thing that they shared, definitely, was the black vote. Because you saw uh, African Americans vo voted almost exclusively re for Republicans. And 1932 was the first time that a lot of African Americans voted for a Democrat. And that was because this was a Democrat who was going to spend a lot of money in social programs that were going to benefit people uh, who lacked resources. 1936 was the first year that African Americans voted overwhelmingly for the Democrats. And then that was something that Truman obviously continued. You saw that trend. Um, labor, both of them, did very well with organized labor. Um, I don't think Truman ever did well with the farm vote the way, I mean, the FDR did with the way that Truman did in 1948. Um, let me think, what else can I answer? What, what, do you have any thoughts on the matter? What do you think? <laughs> 
Well, that, yeah, that's a great point. So you're, I mean, basically you're saying like, imagine what this map would have looked like if all of these states were blue. And in fact, they were during FDR's time, which, you know, and, but then again, I would like to go back and see which states over here Truman won that FDR never did. I'd have to look that up. But I would be surprised if FDR did as, certainly did as well as Truman did in those places. And I'd like to think that, I think that Roosevelt had won a lot more in New England than Truman did. But I, I think, that, you know, traditionally at that time, the Democratic Party thought of itself as like progressives from the West, big city labor, the solid South, and at that time, the black vote, right? So that would have been the traditional coalition. Uh, they lost a lot, some of it over here in 48, and picked up a lot of it in places that they didn't expect to, but I think Truman did expect to, just because those are the places he campaigned really hard with his whistle-stop speeches. <clears throat> Sir? Um, yeah, so uh, was there a concern around Truman about his association with, like, shady mob kind of characters like Pender? Guest or something where the mob boss died and he went to the funeral and was, is that part of this or that came later? That came before and I write about that a lot in this, in my book, The Accidental President. And it's just, the story of Pendergast is something that had a lot to do with Harry Truman's rise. And if you were gonna write a fictional book about the rise of a successful politician this, from Missouri, this would be it. So Pendergast, does everybody, anybody know who Pendergast was? Okay. So Harry Truman came from Independence, Missouri, small town right next to Kansas City. And uh, his rise, which is less so in this book, it's just extraordinary and, and entirely unexpected. Uh, he was a farmer, uh, it's obscure farmer, um, up to the age of, I think, 31. Uh, he's late in life where he goes to World War I. He comes back and he launches a uh, haberdashery, a men's clothing store, which quickly fails um, during the recession, if I remember correctly, of 1920, 21, uh, 22. And he's without a job. And so he's like, I don't know what to do. I'll run for office. And, um, and uh, he goes to Tom Pendergast, who was the head of the Democratic machine in Kansas City and an extraordinarily powerful person. And what Pendergast did, the machine worked like this, the way he defined it himself. Your son needs a job. Um, I'll get your son a job. Uh, and I, you know, I'll do you that favor. You're going to vote for you know all the guys that I say. And he would sit in his office in Kansas City, and people would file in all day long and said, "I'll do you a favor. You got to vote for this guy. You got to vote for that guy." And, until he was extraordinarily powerful to the point where he could pretty much install politicians himself uh, in the state of Missouri. And uh, in 1936, um, Truman. Uh, they need a Senate candidate. And Pendergast, who had all of this legal stuff going on and would eventually go to prison for, uh, has to come up with a Senate candidate from Missouri. And one of his guys says, Harry, how about Harry Truman? And Pendergast says, are you joking? Nobody's heard of him. And then he says, you can't begin to tell me that Harry Truman can get elected to the United States Congress. And those are just about his exact words. And it's incredible what happens next, because Truman runs this campaign. He's driving around Missouri in this Dodge with no gasoline in it. He has no money. He actually has to sleep in his car. And nobody knows who he is, but he wins this election. So when he goes to um, Washington, nobody will talk to him, because they all think that he's Pendergast guy. He's the senator from Pendergast. Um, and uh, years later, um, when Pendergast dies, I, if I remember correctly, and I'm sorry, there's just so much going on in my head. It's very early in, during Truman's years in the White House. Pendergast dies. He had been in prison. And Truman says, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to go to the funeral. And people were um, shocked and appalled. But they, 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 a lot of people were really pleased and impressed by his courage to go and do this, you know, because he knew he would be criticized. And he said, I never betray a friend. Um, but that's the story. It's an incredible story. Read it in my book, The Accidental President. It's good. <laughs> um, there was a question. There's a question there and a question there. You want to start there and we'll move over there? Oh, this gentleman. Let this gentleman go first. Yeah, he's got a microphone. 
Uh, I have two questions. Uh, what is that footnote uh, on Tennessee? Uh, Strom Thurmond won one delegate in Tennessee. So he won all of these votes and he won one delegate there. And honestly, I cannot remember if that was a flip delegate, that would have been a delegate that represented a specific, um, and this is an important question, I should know the answer to this because it's relevant to what's happening in our politics now, whether that's a delegate that flipped, because I think it was, or a delegate that um, represented a specific part of Tennessee. But uh, one delegate from Tennessee uh, went to Thurman. Okay, thanks. Um, the other question is uh, uh, now with Alaska and Hawaii um, coming into the, uh, the demographics, what, what do you see it's, um, it's a major shift from 1948 to 2024? It's more like a general question of how, how the, 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 the electoral demographics play out. Well, Okay, so the question was, how do the electoral demographics play out with the addition of those two states? And the one thing I can say for sure is that um, it was very much an important issue in the 48 campaign, whether to add those two states, and both Dewey supported adding those two states, and uh, Truman supported adding those two states. And as for how that changed the, the electoral, um, I don't believe terribly much, except for the fact that those be, you know continue to be Battlegrounds, you know, I think they're flip states. I think they, they tend to go either way, um, which makes them, you know, strategic, of course, but um, definitely an issue in 1948, whether to support that or not. And that's why, you know, we have 50 states in our flag now, 50 stars. Uh, gentlemen over there. So, uh the presidential campaign is, you know, six to ten months, uh, so in the year 1948 leading up to November. And uh, there, and I don't remember, I'm sorry, I don't remember in history what month or what year even that Truman announced his Truman Doctrine. And would it have been in 47 or sometime first half of 1948? And what were the two or three things in the uh, Truman Doctrine that suddenly made him rather unpopular and sort of led to this um, uh, expectation he would lose. Well, um, as to the second part of your question, I don't think that these the, the Truman Doctrine made him unpopular, but did very much fuel uh, the breakaway Progressive Party's campaign and that Henry Wallace was saying, this is imperialism and this is going to get us in a war. And the issue that really sparked the creation of the Truman Doctrine was uh, the financial problems in Greece and Turkey. So these were two uh, countries in Europe that um, were going down the tubes financially. And the Truman uh, administration realized that if they were going to go down the troops, these two very important countries in Europe were going to fall to the Soviets. And in fact, there was already com communist infiltration in those countries. And if the United States would give a whole bunch of money to those countries, not so that they could fight, we weren't giving them weapons, we weren't uh, throwing fuel on the fire, <laughs> um, we were just helping them to rebuild the infrastructure of their country, which was still destroyed because of the war. They needed roads. They needed just their countries to function. And it was very much in Stalin's interest for these countries to remain po impoverished and without infrastructure because they would become desperate and the Soviets could come and save them. Um, so it was Greece, Turkey. And uh, the lead up to the launch of the, of the Truman Doctrine is very, very dramatic. And, and the way it came about, um, there was another book, I reviewed it for the Washington Post that came out not too long ago about how it was created. I thought it was pretty interesting. It was Joe Scarborough, I think. Um, but that, you know, that, that, was, that was it. And it, it took a lot of convincing to the American people that it was in our best interest to take millions and millions and billions of our own tax dollars and hand it over to Turkey. You know, people couldn't understand that at the time. Um, but the, uh, the message to Congress was critical and it was done effectively. Um, and 
uh, it was a bipartisan policy. They got, the administration got Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan, very uh, powerful senator who was head of the Foreign Relations Committee. They got him on board and it snowballed from there and it happened. But I find so much fascinating about it, it was so radical. Truman once said that some of the decisions that he made were so radical it was gonna take 50 years before they would know whether they were the good decisions or not. And it turned out that they were, and I think that's one of the reasons why Truman left office with miserable approval ratings, because they didn't know if this stuff was gonna work. And it took years and years for us to realize that they were brilliant programs and they did work. So if you're taking audience participation and predicting the future, let me bounce one off of you. Um, every article I read about inflation is, we haven't seen inflation like this in 40 years. Yep. So I would put a slide in a future presentation of Biden next to Carter. And I got at least four, three other parallels that I'll throw at you. And I'm trying to, I'll ask this as apolitically as possible. I think the Soviets going into Afghanistan is the equivalent of them going into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think the rising crime rates in America, people are comparing crime rates today to what they were in the 80s. Um, and um, I have one more. So anyway, um, so the question would be, if in fact you buy that's a parallel and history repeats itself, who is the next Ronald Reagan? And I struggle with it's, it's, it's Trump only because he doesn't sort of have that message of positivity. Um, although you might say that's make America great again, but who would be Reagan other than Trump in the next election? Um, I don't think there's a person who exists that is Reagan today. And uh, I've been reading a tremendous amount of revisionism as we all do about the Reagan presidency, um, particularly in a book by Eddie Gloud uh, that I read recently. Um, we can all look at the Reagan presidency differently depending on where we come from. I myself think, you know, I always grew up thinking Reagan was a great president, even though my parents didn't vote for him. Um, but uh, we, I think that I'm learning that there are many more points of view on Reagan than I thought they were. Um, as to who would be the Reagan today, I don't know. And th to me, a greater question is, who's the next Joe Biden? <laughs> because I, this next election that's coming up it's just gonna be fascinating and riveting. I just hope to death it's a fair election. Um, and I'm just so eager to find out who's gonna be running on both sides and what it is they're gonna represent. I really have no idea. And I don't know if there's a parallel. I mean, the first election I can remember was Carter versus Ford. I was five years old. And uh, you know, I grew up thinking that Carter was a great president just because that's what my parents told me, you know? Do you, do you buy the Biden is, is Carter? And I thought of my fourth analogy, which was our, our, our uh, exit from Afghanistan was similar to what happened from a prestige perspective as Iran. So I Say it think again, sorry? probably at least four potential parallels between the presidents. Say it again, that last part, sorry? It was um, the, uh, us getting the hostages in Iran, I think could be compared to our exit from Afghanistan in terms of what it did to the US in terms of international prestige. Okay, so let me answer the question this way. And I hope this is not an abdication and I don't upset anyone. Um, but, uh, you know, I've written two books about history and there's someone sitting behind you who is the perfect person in this country to answer that question in a way that I could not. <laughs> I'm serious, is that okay? You know, I, I actually think your chronology is all off because the economic malaise and economic recession hits worse in 80, by 82. Uh, and by the same token, you know, the uh, invasion of Afghanistan and the problems in Iran are 79, so right before the election, whereas we've got three years to go until the next election. I don't think people are actually gonna to remember too much about what happened with the US withdrawal from Afghanistan in three and a half years. Whereas all the arguments that you're making are really good, I think, for a democratic debacle in the upcoming midterms. I think, remember, Reagan has all the same economic problems in 82 and winds up winning one of the greatest landslides of ever in 84. So 
listening to your analysis, I'm going to put my money on the Republicans for the midterm, but I'm going to you know, suggest that Biden's going to win a second term, because Reagan did. If, if, Excellent. If, Thank if, you, Thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate you and your support. And please keep your eye out on our website and through your email for any updates that will be coming about the summer and next fall. So everyone drive safe and have a good night. Oh, and buy books, and, and AJ will be in here to sign if you'd like.